before we get started, uh, before I turn to these gentlemen, I, I want to give a little uh, some context for why, for why we have them here at our Ideas We Should Steal Festival. So as of this week in Philadelphia, 488 people have been killed, um, and another more than 1,700 people were shot. The number of homicides is about 7% lower than last year, which is good. Um, but that is progress only, relatively speaking. Murders are up by 95% since 2015. Um, and the number of non-fatal shootings is slightly down from 2021, but of course the year is not done. What's more, it is more likely that you will get away with murder in Philly um, than not. Our police department has a 47% clearance rate, which means they make arrests in fewer than half of the cases before them. Um, so the pandemic led to spikes in shootings all over the country, but again, you know, Philadelphia's uh, gun violence was on the rise even before 2020. Um, and in 2015, Philly stopped using the proven data-driven gun violence prevention program that is systematically and compassionately cutting violence around the country, including in Chester, uh, which in 2020 launched the Chester Partnership for Safe Neighborhoods, a version of ceasefire or what we called it here, focused deterrence. Those of you who were with us in 2019 may recall hearing from David Mohammed from the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform, who talked about Oakland's incredible success cutting gun violence in half over several years. Um, so I'm just gonna in brief tell you the five parts that Ceasefire has before I talk about how you all um, made it happen in, in Chester. So um, it has five parts. It has analysis of who is doing or is at risk of shooting or being shot. Um, call-ins, which are periodic in-person gatherings with those at risk of being involved with violence to, in essence, make sure they understand the legal and personal consequences of their behavior. Social services, which are offered to those at risk um, by violence interrupters who offer help with everything from housing to food to education to jobs, um, whatever it needs to sort of get them past particularly this, the, the critical moment that they're in. Um, narrowly, narrowly focused law enforcement actions. Um, the idea that arrests will happen, prosecutions will happen if the shooting continues. And intentional management, uh, the bringing together regularly of all the agencies involved in keeping the streets safe. So, so through its version of Ceasefire, Chester's Partnership for Safe Neighborhoods has had really similarly striking, striking results to Oakland. Um, so we have a slide that explains this, and um, Mayor Kirtland, can you walk us through the numbers? Sure. First of all, thank you for having us. Yeah. This is an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you this morning um, to share our great success in um, the first city in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Chester, Pennsylvania. When I became, um, first became mayor, I, I um, made one commitment, one promise. I don't think when you run for office, you should make too many promises. <laughs> but I, I made one promise, and I, and I promised the citizens of Chester that I would do my best to cut um, violent crime in half by 50%. And with the help of this partnership, we've been going above and beyond that. Um, as you see, this 62% uh, rating um, when it comes to the decrease in fatal crimes, that's, that's awesome. We would like to be zero. We would like to be 100%. And that's our goal, to make sure that folks uh, can actually live together without being violent towards one another. Uh, the 65% um, decrease in gun violence homicides, that's because we have a DA, a district attorney, and a commissioner that work side by side, along with community groups, to say, you know what, we can find a better way to uh, give, these, give these persons, I don't like to call them criminals all the time, but give these persons a, a better opportunity to find a better way out. Sometimes it's just, as you just stated, sometimes it's just being able to have food on the table. Folks don't really realize sometimes that these persons become violent or they commit these crimes because of their situation at home. 54%, uh, and this, this is a, a decrease in gun violence uh, of individuals in 2019. We have been working tirelessly together as partnership 
tirelessly to make sure that we not only meet with each other, but we meet with different groups and we meet with those young people or not so young people who would possibly be the ones committing these crimes and sitting them down and saying, what do you need, what do we need to do for you to help you better yourselves and take the right road and not the wrong road? Is it an educational opportunity? Is it employment? Is it food? Is it daycare? And so rather than try to lock folks up or lock their, your way up out of this situation, we try to offer them alternatives. And these numbers show that we are doing just that. So, so Dean Stolzheimer, you, know, you talked about doing, um, similarly to, to Mayor Kirkland, you, you talked about doing focused deterrence in Chester when you ran for DA in 2019, right? Yes, um, can you, like, why was that important to you? Can you talk a little bit about, about that and how it got off the ground? Sure. Uh, I I'm passionate about focused deterrence because I had spent uh, four and a half years as a federal prosecutor here in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania uh, trying to implement this in all the nine counties that we were uh, representing or we were the federal prosecutor for, with some great success in some places, including Philadelphia. Uh, both District Attorney Lynn Abraham and her uh, colleague and uh, or successor, uh, Seth Williams, really bought into the program uh, and started doing this in the city of Philadelphia with great success. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's a wonderful program because it's one of the few times when law enforcement can proactively go out and try to do something to stop violence and partnering with the community to do so. And that's really what this program is all about and why those of us who know about it um, really get passionate about it because we get an opportunity to talk to those 1% of people who are involved in the killings, and a lot of them don't want to be involved in this anymore. This is group violence that they might be involved with because of their friendships with people, or they might just want to get out of that life. Uh, and we have a chance by partnering with community groups to offer them a way out. We'll help you if you let us, is what we tell them, but we're going to stop you if you make us. And so in the law enforcement community, this is just a smart community policing idea, and Stephen will talk more about how they've just taken it and run with it with the Chester Police Department. But it's really an opportunity for us to go into the community and tell people, and I gotta tell you, the people in the city of Chester now, when they see Chester police officers in high crime areas not arresting people, but just, disrupt, just being out there as a presence to disrupt people, they can't get enough of these guys. Um, we get thanked, the mayor and I, every time we go around the neighborhoods because women can now walk across the street to buy uh, milk for their grandchildren without being shot at. Something that shouldn't be a, you know, that unusual in America, right? This is the United States of America, after all. For me, this is really important because Chester is the only city in Delaware County. So I thought, really, we could do this. It's also a very self-contained community, and one that I'm very passionate about because I know how wonderful the people who live there are. Because as you know, Roxanne, my mother came to this country as a World War II Ukrainian refugee from a Nazi slave labor camp. For my family, the first place we ever experienced freedom and community was in the city of Chester. Yeah. So I have a special warm place in my heart for Chester. I think the mayor and Stephen will tell you how great the people are. And I think that's one of the things you have to keep in mind with these statistics. The people in the city of Chester are responding mm -hmm. to what we're doing. Um, not just the good people who want the violent crime to stop and who embrace what we're doing, but also the young people who don't want to live this life anymore. They're now proud that Chester is no longer one of the most violent small cities in America. Uh, and we're hearing that all the time. And I'm sure, Stephen, you hear it every day on the beat. Absolutely. So how does it work? Tell, tell us what you did. I mean, what, what, is the, um, what were the steps it took to get here? Well, I, I'll, I'll let Stephen you know, talk more about what the Chester PD is doing. But really, what we've done is, for the first time, the, the, the lead agencies, the Attorney General Josh Shapiro, Thaddeus Kirkland, myself, Congresswoman Scanlon, and our county council, We've all banded together and saying we're going to just all work on this one program together. We're going to offer whatever social services we could. Uh, the, the, the certified messengers were provided by county council funding, for example. Uh, Mary Gay Scanlon has been a messenger out in the community for us as well. Uh, Josh Shapiro's gun violence unit has been a great resource, particularly when we started prosecuting people for carrying ghost guns. 
But the real difference maker, I mean, the, the elected officials being on the same page is fantastic, and it provides resources. But the difference making are the, the men and women of law enforcement who have worked closely together. My deputy district attorney, Matt Krause, my first assistant, Tanner Rouse, had done this. We recruited them from the DA's office in the city of Philadelphia when the current DA got elected um, because they had done this program and believed in it. Stephen stepped up uh, and is a passionate about community policing. Uh, my, the former police chief of Chester is now the chief county detective. So my detective bureau now supports fully everything his department is doing. And we've changed the way we do business in the DA's office to make sure that we're doing everything we can to bring charges whenever we need to, uh, but also to support you guys on a daily basis. And if you want to talk about the, the, the review, sh shooting review, Stephen, and, sure. and just the way you guys have been just <clears throat> fantastic. So normally from a, a police department, and um, I repeat this over and over, and I'm passionate about it, I call it a one plus uh, one rule. I have the district attorney, Jack Stoltimer, and I have Mayor Thaddeus Kirkland, who stands behind me and stands behind this police department. And with these two main pieces, this is why you get the results you do. Uh, I'm born and raised in the city of Chester. I come from a law enforcement background. My father ran the narcotics division. Uh, I have a brother, John, who also was running the city of Chester narcotics division, which he actually retired, and he's actually at the district attorney's office. Um, so on Mondays, I meet with the mayor. We go over weekend review. We go over stats, we go over community ideas, and then on Thursdays, we do a review meeting with the City of Chester Police Department and the District Attorney's Office, and all we do is strategize. People sometimes look at me and say, oh, you're the police commissioner? I say, no, I'm a uh, meeting commissioner. Uh, <laughs> but it's, the key point is, is that you need to have the right pieces in place, and when you do, these are the results that you get. So, but it isn't all about law enforcement, right? It is, you know, it is about, and, and the, the piece of this that I think um, I'd love to have you talk about is, um, is, is there's also a social service piece to this, right? So it isn't just about arresting everybody, um, which I'll get back to you on that, because I think is interesting from a police angle. Um, so what are, what are some of the things that you do besides arresting people that have st helped to, to, to stop the shooting? It, the attitude that we take is not just lock them up, it's help them up. Um, and help them up at a very young age. The, the commissioner and I have, and along with the uh, district attorney, we, we've gone to uh, daycare centers, daycare centers, so that young people and their caretakers can see law enforcement in a positive light. We've gone to recreational centers. You, you haven't seen uh, Jack Stolzheimer play basketball yet. You probably don't want to. No. But we've, <laughs> we've gone to boys and girls club events, and we've gone to biddy league basketball events, and uh, interacted and engaged with young people to let them know that we're human just like they are. And they get to the point where that wall is being torn down, and now they're able to open up to us to talk to us about very personal things within their own lives. And so, and we also have, the, the commissioner goes to our local high school to talk to young people. We're trying to engage them and trying to encourage them to become law enforcement personnel. Um, a lot of times in past time, you know, if you go to a young person and say, uh, I want you to be a part of the police department, they'll say, I don't want to be a snitch. Right. I'm like, it's not, you're not a snitch, it's a job. It's a job that helps protect and serve your community. And, and, and it's a great job to have here in the community. So we're, we do a lot of outreach working with uh, young people from, from preschool to high school to college and those persons, then we work with those persons who are unemployed. How can we help get them? Because if you get some of these men and women employed, get them opportunities, trained, uh, prepared for employment, then this is my old adage, they go to work, they get tired, they come home, and they go to sleep. <laughs> and they get ready to do the same thing the next day over and over again. So that is what, it's, it's a community approach, it's a hands-on approach, and it starts from the youngest to the eldest. So, but who are, the, now you have, um, you know, part of, part of the way Ceasefire Focus Deterrence works is you have uh, people from the community who go and actually interact with um, the mostly young men who are at risk of gun violence. Um, 
So who do you have doing that, and how does that, how does that work? Sure, so right now we've had one person who's been done it funded by our county council. Uh, we now are hiring three other people. We were able to get a $2 million grant in part because of the Attorney General's support um, from the state. So we're now expanding that program. There's also what's called the Foundation from Delaware County, which um, is a great uh, organization that has really uh, been funding a lot of great community groups that work in the city of Chester. So the Chester Community Coalition, um, uh, uh, Making a Change Group, these folks have all been working, and they work in partnership, but also separately, right? So they're out there in the community spreading the word about, like, we can help you. We're okay. trauma-informed. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what the mayor is talking about is exactly right. The biggest issue we are up against is the poverty that too many people live in in the city of Chester, which makes it more easy to want to go out and do something criminal than it is to try to find a job. Um, so we, we work with those groups, and they're trying to do that. But we also just, in our own, the partnership itself, has been trying to help people on an individual level. So we've actually had a gentleman who came to us and said, I want to get out of the drug business. I want to get out of the violence business. And I want to become a commercial driver. Right? He wants to drive trucks, but he needs a CDL license. So we actually funded his ability to get his CDL license. So I mean, we have to take those proactive right. big steps, but we also on an individual level, because as you write, and you know this, Roxanne, focused deterrence is really about that 1% of people who are willing to kill uh, or be caught up in the game right. that we're going to lead to a killing. So we individually say to them, we will help you or we will stop you. Your choice. Here's the community groups. Here's the mayor. Here's the people who want to help you. Please take us up on it. If you don't, I'm telling you, we know who you run with. We know you, what you've been doing. It's just a matter of time. And we're increasingly seeing that happen. The 68% case closing number for this year is unbelievable compared to Philadelphia and the history of Delaware County. It hasn't been over 50% since 2004. We've done it for three years in a row. And that's sending a message, right, that if you do mess with us, if you do kill somebody, we're going to hunt you down and get you. We're now at the point where we can hear bad guys on prison calls telling their compatriots back home, don't do it. <clears throat> put down the guns. My deputy DA, Kraus, got a call last year after a shooting. Uh, Stephen knows this. <clears throat> One of the leaders of a, of a group called him up and said, we had nothing to do with that. This is hours after a shooting. He's calling a deputy district attorney saying, that wasn't us. We didn't do it. We're getting the message. So, and I think that that's what these people need to hear. And a lot of these young people who are involved in this stuff, they want something else to do. There's a lack of opportunities in this country. We've, you know, it's been 70 years since we've invested in our cities in this country. I mean, you know, my family was able to get in the middle class because of manufacturing jobs. Well, those, those jobs aren't here anymore, right? We got to bring them back. We got to provide opportunities to people. We can only do so much, particularly, you know, in, in law enforcement. We can only do so much, and we're partnering with people who can do more. But at the national and at the state level, we need more help. But on an individual basis, Roxanne, if, if somebody who we have identified as being a shooter or a potential shooter or victim comes forward, absolutely we drop everything and get them help. And Stephen, his, his cell phone number is now known throughout the city of Chester, for better or for worse, for poor Stephen, because he's been doing a lot of this work himself. So Commissioner Presky, I wanted to ask you, you know, part of, part of what is interesting and, and I think can be difficult about focused deterrence is having to tell police officers who, you know, who, um, that they're, they're maybe not gonna make an arrest, right? That we're not, we may not go and arrest that guy because we have a different approach to trying to cut violence. So how do you, how do you square that with the, with the people in your, under, in your command? So um, I'll give you, when I took over as commissioner um, in 2020, we had our highest homicide rate for the city of Chester. Um, I took over in October, and the first thing I did was I put out a vision statement to my officers, and my vision uh, statement makes you feel more of a team, not just your badge number that sits on the collar, your uh, pins. Also, I went back to the rooting of policing, community policing. A lot of times um, I would hear complaints, you know, you see officers sit on 291, hiding by Harris Casino, you see them sitting by a field. But now, with us partnering together, they know the clergy members, they know the store members, they're out on feet. Uh, years ago, there was a, a detail called Operation Trigger Lock where we would just proactive, try to lock up as many people as we can. 
I renamed it Operation Safe Streets. Go out, buy the kids ice cream, let's shoot hoops, let's throw the football, get out and know everyone. And last week with Melissa Murrow from his office, um, there was an individual who had control on the Chester, city of Chester for years, and we would use the OG term. He would never come to the police station. I met him, I talked to him, he came there. His father was killed in the city of Chester. His uncle was doing life for murder. And he told Melissa, he goes, I would never ever step in here. The only reason I'm stepping in here is respect for Steven. And we're gonna bring him on. And he spoke to a group of individuals already. And he has a lot of influence in the city of Chester. He goes, you know how this game goes. You got an option A, the cemetery, or option B, the penitentiary. And when you have a police officer sitting next to him, they could feel that. You could feel the energy coming from him, but they would never think that me and him would be sitting next to each other. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Can I just say something to you? Yeah. That's fantastic. But this is, Stephen is the new generation of police officer. I think there's a misconception of people policing in this country anymore. But they don't want to just lock people up. They want to be public servants. They want to be guardians of their community. What Stephen is articulating is I think the majority of police officers, certainly the ones that we work with in Delaware County, and I think across the country, we shouldn't just have this 1970s mentality about how police officers are. They're not that way anymore. They want to do what's best for the community. And I think Stephen's leadership is, speaks for itself in the city of Chester, but we've got police chiefs all over the county who do the same thing, and I think across the country. And I think we as a community need to say that. Uh, I think policing has gotten too bad a name in the last few years. It's not the 1970s anymore. Frank Rizzo is long dead, even in the city of Philadelphia. The police officers are servants. They're public servants. These are people who are willing to walk in and get shot and killed for people they don't even know. Uh, we've got to give them the honor and respect, but we also have to demand accountability. And Stephen is okay with that, as are every police officer I work with in Delaware County. Um, this is a new world, and we're ready for it. And then in Philadelphia, we do have the, the Fraternal Order of Police, which fights the people who run the department in, in trying to clean it up. So, so you know, Philadelphia, I think, is a little bit, it, it may be a little bit different than, than what you experience in Chester, which is not to say the majority of police officers by any means, but I think that there are the accountability piece, I feel like, is part of what needs to happen, right? And so do you, I mean, do you stress that? I mean, is there, is there do police officers feel like there's an accountability piece to their work, too? I, I, I do, but also, um, I sit down with my officers, I sit down with my team. I have an open door policy. Um, during leadership roles, uh, there's three different types. There's a laser cuisine where you just lay back, let the department run. I don't do that. And yeah. then there's the old school audiocratic, uh, it's my way or the highway. I don't. And then there's the democratic approach, is which my approach is. I take their ideas. We do things together. And at the end of the day, I'm the head of the table and I got to make that decision, but I bring them to the team and use some of their ideas to make them feel better. You would also think, and just add this to that, you would also think that Chester has, with those numbers, uh, with those great numbers, that Chester has 125, 130 police officers on the street. We're way below our number, extremely below our number. We just did a 4th of July event um, with about 2,000 some odd people uh, in the park, young people, older persons, in the park, uh, three officers and a drone. No incidents, everybody just enjoying one another simply because they know our police officers and our officers know them. They know our DA and the DA knows them. They know the mayor and the mayor knows them. And the partnership and, and the realness that we bring to events like that make a, a huge difference in our community. So, and what kind of feedback, you know, have you, you know, how hard was it to convince people in Chester, residents of Chester, that, that there was gonna be this partnership, that, that, that this was gonna work? I don't think it was hard at all. I think, uh, well, let me just back up a little bit. I think that they were hesitant at the very beginning because folks have been promised things for decades, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do this. And it, it's the same old thing over and over again. I think this time they, they saw us, when I say us, they saw us meeting, they saw us bring in uh, the, the um, Josh Shapiro, they saw us working with other agencies and groups, 
and they knew some of those agencies and groups. Their kids were part of those agencies and groups. And when they saw that, they realized that this thing is real. And they knew that we were committed to it because we didn't just meet once a year and just, I'll see you next year, I'll see you next Christmas. But we met constantly because we wanted to do it and do it right. So part of, um, part of and you mentioned the 1% of, of people who are committing gun violence. Um, what do you know about the, the people who are um, shooters or at risk of being shooters in Chester? What, do, you have, do you have a sense of, of their age or you know, why this is happening? Yeah, I think Stephen would agree that in most cases they're younger people, right? Mm -hmm. One of the realities of, 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 of violent crime is uh, violent crime is a, a component of poverty. Uh, you find it in neighborhoods and in areas where you've got a, a deep concentration of poverty. Everybody wants to be part of something larger than themselves, and so people get into groups, uh, and those groups fight for turf and for respect. Um, and it's particularly problematic for young people, especially young males, um, who are going through that part of life when they're trying to establish their identity in the world. Um, there's this phenomenon where people generally try to, they, they age out of violent crime oftentimes. Um, and those are the folks, like as Stephen said, who now become the people who really want to, they see it. They, they've seen mm -hmm. their friends die, right? And they've seen that they barely survived themselves and they want to help find a, a different path. So, and that's particularly true across the country right now. You're seeing a, a wave of violent crime uh, that's driven by juveniles um, and largely driven by the fact that we have like uncontrolled uh, access to firearms, um, especially during the pandemic. I mean, every gun shop in the area was, was sold out within a, a month or two of the... At, especially with ghost guns and traceable yeah. firearms is yeah. another one we deal with. Yeah. So um, one of the things that we, we've learned actually in Philadelphia, which is interesting, is that um, I think the average age of um, shooters in Philadelphia is 30 which is um, significantly higher, actually, than I think people necessarily expected. And, um, and so programs that work in preschools, that work in, you know, the, in youth centers are not, are, not, are not reaching them, right? Those are, not, those are not reaching those people today. Those are reaching people, you know, that, that, those are all great programs. And so, um, you know, do you, how, how do you, how do you identify who they are? I mean, are they just, are they just known to you because you're able to know who those people are? Do you have, is it violence interrupters who are at meetings saying, this is what we know and this is how we're solving it? Well, generally in focused deterrence, what you do is you start with an intel gathering. So right, so you- Law enforcement agencies get together. It's pretty evident pretty quickly that we all know who the actors are in a neighborhood and then they figure out who they're connected to. Uh, right. Your team has done that with CID and with Krauss. Mm -hmm. They keep that information. And what we try to do then <clears throat> is make sure that we're using the violence interrupters and people to send the message so it's amplified. It's not just from law enforcement. Uh, do you want to talk about the call-in that we did in, in October of 2020? Yeah, sure. But to, um, Roxanne, to go off your question is uh, my narcotics division, my intelligence division, you walk up there on the fourth floor. And in the city of Chester, we don't have gangs. It's not like you have the Bloods, the Crips, whatever name you want to use. It's more about the neighborhood you're, you're from and where you represent. Mm -hmm. So I have every beat, every neighborhood broken down from juveniles to adults. I have every nickname. I have every person's government name. I have where your uh, baby mother sleeps. I know where your mother lives. We have the whole layout for uh, the city of Chester. And to go off uh, what Jack's saying, our first call and what we did, we had it at the courthouse and we had myself, CID, the Sheriff's Department, probation and parole, and we brought in probably 30 of the most influenced individuals in the city of Chester who have respect and who have control of over some of the uh, juveniles or younger individuals. And when we brought them in, the look on their face and they all looked at each other, it looked like they were getting federally indicted. They had the look of like they saw a ghost but when we started uh, the kickoff of the meeting, Jack started the meeting, and you can see where we really have the district attorney three feet from us, and he wants to help us. And then my part was, and everyone in Chester knows me, you know, they felt a little more comfortable, but I told them, we are gonna press you if you don't stop. We, I will make you fold sooner or later, but we'll do it the right way. And then Matthew Krause came in, and then he started naming everyone from the intelligent unit 
uh, before they could even go back to the county prison, they were asking to speak, please, 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 hold on, don't take us yet, don't take us yet. And then that's where the prison phone calls came in. Hey, you know, they're serious. They want to help us. They're here for us. You know, we know who you are. We know what you're doing. If you want to get involved with this program, we will supply any need that you need. Uh, last week, uh, another individual program needed uh, has a job. He needed transportation. They set up transportation for him. Mm -hmm. And that word gets out and they get to talking. So we're going to take a, a, we have time for a question, but I, I want to ask you, so to be clear, Chester is a tiny city compared to Philadelphia in particular. And so it's easy to think that the lessons learned in Chester are not applicable to the city of Philadelphia, but um, you don't see it that way, right? Not at all. No, it's- Why? Because you just have to do it in ink spots across the city of Philadelphia. Right at a time. Right. Exactly. Oh, an ink spot is just, just you, you. The city of Chester essentially equals a police district in the, in the city of Philadelphia. So every police district where you've got a serious violence problem, you should be doing this in the mm -hmm. city of Philadelphia. And once you add those ink spots together, you're going to eventually solve the problem, or you're at least going to greatly reduce the volume. It's more um, difficult in that you need more resources. I mean, having uh, Steven Gretzky and having Matt Krause uh, running the program are tremendous assets, right? right? And to have to replicate them across the city is more difficult, no question about that. But once you make the commitment to it and you see the body of evidence and you see what we've done, you, you got to realize there's no other way to do this. This is like, you know, everybody wants to lose weight, right? And everybody knows how to lose weight, right? You got to, <laughs> he's in great shape. You look great. <laughs> You gotta exercise more and you gotta stop eating as much crap, right? Those are the two ways. Yet everybody doesn't do that, right? They wanna do, they either wanna exercise more or they wanna eat more healthy. But that's why people fail because the program is really you have to do both things. Mm -hmm. And if you do both things together and you realize that the, the body of work will show you the success, you just have to replicate it. And the city of Philadelphia was on that path. Um, but it, I'm always sort of surprised shocked and not shocked at the same time, but the, the guy who's the guru of the program was the Harvard researcher from Boston Ceasefire, David Kennedy, who, by the way, is a Delaware County guy, Swarthmore College, class of 1980, um, and is, you know, the John Jay School, but he gets hired all the time and, and, and to go across the country and talk to government officials about it, and they glad hand him and yep, 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 but they don't follow through yeah. because they're not serious about losing weight, right? They just talk about it, but then they don't do it, and that's, that's what I think the real lesson here is we were just, no, we're going to do it. If right. we're going to do it, we're going to do it, and everybody bought in, and that's how you make it work. And it, and it could be done here in Philly because, like I said, one bite at a time. No one, no one eats a whole cake since you talk about losing weight <laughs> at one time. Yeah. You take one bite at a time, one neighborhood at a time, and everybody has to be on the same page. The city council, mayor, DA's office, uh, law enforcement, everybody on the same page saying we're going to take this area and we're going to turn it around uh, for the good, um, the community leaders, and people like success stories. They'll see you do that. They'll see that success found in that neighborhood, in that part of the community, and it starts to spread like wildfire. So uh, I think we have time for one question. There's a few. Stolzheimer's got me thinking about going on a diet now. <laughs> uh, come up here. Holy shit. Sorry about that. It's already on. You don't have to turn it on. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Larry. All those hands are up. Um, thank you so much for being here, and congratulations. Um, the spirit of collaboration is really evident, and I can tell because of how you bust on one another in public <laughs> that you have personal chemistry. But um, getting into the nitty gritty, the economics of this problem, um, like you mentioned earlier, there's not a good alternative economically. Manufacturing's not coming back. That has been automated away and more Middle, middle skill jobs, middle wage jobs are going to continue to be automated. And the question I have around problem solving that you've experienced is when you sit down with um, a, a, per, a young person who is caught up in this and they have um, you know, children and they know that if they have a job on the books 
that a, a significant portion of those wages are going, going to be siphoned off for their legal obligation to their children. How do you work around the problem of the economics that if they, the job that they can do doesn't make sense to cover the cost of their lives? Like how, how have you worked around that? Yeah, so I, the one example I mentioned is the, the, the gentleman who literally could make a lot more money supporting his family by selling weed uh, than he could any other way in the city of Chester. And, but he figured out a way to, to both feel good about himself uh, and to, to not keep himself out of jail. Because eventually you're going to go to jail or die and your kids are not going to have anybody to support them, right? So what he did was he decided to become a, a, a truck driver. Uh, and I, I think all of us have to do that at some point in our lives is figure out you know, with the obligations we've got and the dreams we have, how do we find a path forward? Not, and it's particularly hard when people live in places like Chester. I mean, this country for 70 years has stopped investing in its own people. Um, and we have to turn that around. I, I disagree with you a little bit about manufacturing. I do think that there is manufacturing jobs. I used to be the deputy state treasurer for our a college savings program and you know 3D manufacturing is just really in its infancy and it requires a higher degree of skills than kids are getting in high school but it's there and we're going to have to repatriate a lot of jobs back as this growing cold war with China continues to, to take over the world I think there's a lot of change potentially happening there's also things like we just had nuclear fusion happen the other day right I know it's five seconds of clean energy but the future really is right around the corner, and there could be whole new discoveries and a, and a, and a virtual new world for, for, our, for these people and opportunities. But we have to start with the basics, which is like you gotta, you gotta keep yourself out of jail, right? You gotta get on a path of the straight and narrow. You gotta find your own personal redemption. Because a lot of what this is about, and, 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 and Stephen, you know this from, from JP and from some of the people that you've dealt with, that they have to find within themselves that they want to live a different lifestyle, uh, and they want to feel good about who they are. Um, so I think that first step, and then anything we can do, and again, we're limited, we're local government officials, we get that, but anything we can do to help you find that path, we will do. But the whole country has to do this. We as a society have to start sticking up for these people. I, I, I got passionate about politics by reading about Robert F. Kennedy's speeches, Bobby Kennedy's speeches, when I was in high school 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. and how we were under-investing in our cities back then. And we've done nothing since. Right. We've made the situation worse by letting capitalism take all these jobs like my father had to get into the middle class uh, overseas. Well, we've got to reverse that. We can do it. It's a democracy. Right? If we want something different, a different pathway, let's, let's figure it out. But having these conversations, I think, is the first step. Great. Thank you.